Okay, welcome to another lab experiment with me, your lab partner for the semester. And this lab experiment is called transcinamic acid. Well, we're not making transcinamic acid. We're starting with transcinamic acid. And if you've paid attention to the pre-lab videos, you kind of know what's in store. We have a molecule. This molecule has a double bond. This double bond has to be broken. This double bond will be broken by the addition of bromine. One bromine on one carbon, one bromine on another. And it's up to us to figure out how those bromines get attached. Do they go on the same side or do they go on different sides? All right, so if you want to know more about the background, that's where you're going to find this in the pre-lab videos. So let's talk about the actual lab part. That's what we're here today to discuss, isn't it? And the, one of the first pieces that we're going to have is is a separatory funnel. Now, this separatory funnel is a little different than some of the others that we've used before in the past. And the reason is because this separatory funnel has a joint. And here's the joint at the very bottom. This joint means that it will fit perfectly into our glassware that we use in our lab facility. This joint is a 2440 joint. This is a very standard joint for many of the different pieces of glassware in any type of laboratory environment, not just ours, but any of our local and surrounding employers uh, very often will use 2440 as well. It's basically the length and the width of the actual joint itself. They come in different sizes, glassware comes in different sizes, and it's very important that you pick out the right joint for what your laboratory uses. And ours is 2440, pretty standard. All right, so there's our separatory funnel. That's going to get our bromine liquid. So you'll see that in, in just a couple of slides. Uh, here we also have to have a volume, or not a volumetric flask, but a bowling flask. And this is a 50 milliliter round bottom bowling flask. Again, they come in different sizes. We've got 50s, we have 100s, we have 250s, we have 500s, we have 1000s, and I think we even have a 2 liter or a 3 liter bowling flask as well. So different sizes depending on the amount of stuff that we need to use, and we're going to be on the smaller side of the house with this lab experiment, so we don't need anything too large, uh, and 50 milliliters is just the right size for what we need in this experiment. So we're going to pull one of those. We need to use one of these into our setup as well. Uh, the next piece of glassware is something called a Clayson adapter. So this is a Clayson adapter, and a Clayson adapter is just a diverter. Uh, that's really all that it is. Uh, so typically what happens is that in the bottom of the Clayson adapter here, this is where my bowling flask is going to end up going. So my bowling flask with the transcinamic acid and so forth is going to be located here. That beaker is going to be heated up. And that beaker is going to have vapor that's going to get formed. And that vapor will leave the bowling flask and it will come up through the Clayson ad adapter. The reason that I'm choosing a Clayson adapter is because we actually have two things that need to go on throughout this experiment. The first one is the addition of bromine, and the second one is a reflux. We want to make sure that we keep this sucker warm and that we keep it warm throughout the entire time. So I need a refluxer. So any of these vapors that will eventually escape up through this route well, there's going to be a reflux up there waiting on it. And that reflux condenser is going to take the vapors and condense them back down into a liquid so it goes back down into the boiling flask. Well, you're probably questioning, well, what's the purpose of this one then? Well, this is going to be our separatory funnel. So over time, I need to add portions of bromine to this flask. And it's going to be very difficult if I don't have a very easy way like this to add that bromine. In other words, what would have to happen if I did not have the Clayson adapter is I would have to take the whole glassware setup apart. And then I would have to add a few drops and then put all the glassware setup back together. And this stuff is going to be heated and it's going to create vapors and fumes. And I'm going to be losing some of it if that's what I decide to do. So we need something creative and a Clayson adapter is going to allow that to happen for us. So I need to pull one of these and that's the purpose of using that. 
This solution mixture, it also has to be stirred for a long period of time just to make sure that everything is getting stayed mixed together. Uh, I'm not really worried about charring or burning any type of material here. It's simply due to forcing these things to come in contact with each other. So I do need a magnet, and that's what you're seeing here. I've chosen a 50 milliliter bowling flask. Therefore, I don't need a large magnet, do I? I mean, that little 50 milliliter, it looked like a little baby flask. So here's a little baby magnet that goes into that bowling flask. In the lab directions, it also tells me to get a water bath prepped, and that water bath needs to stay at 50 degrees, give or take a little bit. Okay, so a water bath is simply just that. It's like a jacuzzi. It's a jacuzzi tub for all of our materials that we're going to be reacting with. So here's the hot plate, and on the hot plate, I've got a beaker, and on that beaker, I've got water and a thermometer probe. That's what you see sticking up here out of the top. All right, so that thermometer probe is going into a live digital readout with me, so that way I can keep track of the temperature throughout this time. But I've got the water bath going. I'll go ahead and turn it on. i am not even have it halfway, okay? I'm going to say maybe a quarter, a little more than a quarter of the way up. And I'm allowing this to heat while I'm assembling everything else. This is going to take some time. It's like boiling spaghetti water. You're not just going to get it immediately, and we don't get it immediately here either. All right, finally, I need a reflux condenser. This is what the reflux condenser looks like. Maybe you've seen this in some of our other labs. But this reflux condenser sometimes is also called an Allen condenser. So either one of these, whatever term you want to use to describe it, perfectly fine with me, no big deal. All right, so there's our glassware that we need to assemble together to make the trans apparatus. Now, I don't have a picture of it together yet, and the reason is because we've got some more measurements. We have to weigh out some things. We have to add some things to that glassware before we put it all together on us, and that's what we're going to do now. All right, so in the lab directions, it tells me to gather the trans acid. So here's our trans acid from the lab. Uh, this is in a gray bottle. I see the red cap. That also makes me think organic. And anytime something organic-y like this comes around, this is what we often see. It is a solid material. It's not a liquid. Some people might see the red cap and maybe automatically put it into the flammable cabinet. It's not necessarily the case, but it's a very good sign that it does go inflammable. However, where we store our trans acid is with the other acids that's in our lab. So we have acetic acid there, which really should be inflammables as well. But some of these other organic molecular structures that are flammable, if they are acids, we put ours into the acid cabinet. All right, it just kind of makes logical sense for us. Trans acid, oh, that's an acid. I'm probably going to find that in the acid cabinet. You're probably not going to be looking in flammables unless you know something about it. All right, so trans acid, 98% plus. And the manufacturer for trans acid is Acros Organics. You can see that on the label up here at the very top. And then the lot number. The lot number is also stamped. It's right here, and it's A032493529. So you might need that for your laboratory notebook. So A032493529. The molecular weight's also stamped on the bottle. It says 148.18 or 16. I'm going to round that up to 148.2. I think that's what your laboratory procedure does as well. And the problem here is that we need to go through and we need to measure this out. We need a certain amount uh, for this lab experiment. Now, the problem is that the lab directions are going to tell me, well, you need to weigh out 10 millimoles. Well, my balance doesn't measure millimoles. My balance measures grams. So I need to convert that 10 millimole into a gram unit. And this is how we do it. All right, so I'm going to take 10 millimoles of substance over one. And I'm going to bring in dimensional analysis. Dimensional analysis is my friend in general chemistry. I, I can't forget about that friend in Gen Chem that was introduced to me. And we use it all the time in a laboratory field. So 10 millimole, uh, I've got millimole up on top as my unit. 
And I can't really use millimole. I've already said my balance doesn't measure in millimoles. That's silly. I need to measure in grams. I need to get into gram. All right, well, how do I do that? Well, I use the formula weight or molecular weight of this compound. So this is gram per mole. Oh, well, if I know mole, I can get into gram because that's what my formula weight says, right? So in order to get to mole first, I got to get out of millimole, though. All right, so millimole on top, millimole on the bottom, and I need to get to mole. That's my first step. I need to get out of that prefix. So milli means a thousand. Again, think of millennia. That's a thousand years. So one thousand millimoles is one mole. Well, I'm getting closer. I'm not quite there yet. Mole on top, mole goes on the bottom, and I need to go to gram. Well, Eureka, I've just got here, right? I just told you formula weight or molecular weight is gram per mole, one mole. Okay, well, how many grams are in one mole of transdynamic acid? 148.2. Okay, so 148.2 grams in one mole. Folks, there's the right setup for dimensional analysis with this problem. And if you do this calculation, you're going to see about 1.482 grams of material that we will need to measure out in this lab experiment. So I'll show you what we actually used a little bit in just a second, but this was the math that goes behind of converting 10 millimolars into grams. All right, so if you know how to do this, great, good for you. Just regard this as a review and as a confirmation that you still know how to do it. All right, what's next is glacial acetic acid. Glacial acetic acid, the term glacial means as concentrated as it's going to get. Okay, so this is as concentrated as acetic acid is going to be. And if you're thinking about strengths in terms of molarity, then this is a 17.4 molarity solution. Now, why is this important? Well, the reason that this is important is because sometimes we have to weaken this down. Sometimes we have to go and weaken the acetic acid down and make other things, a.k.a. vinegar that you might keep in your pantry. That's a measly three or five percent solution and glacial acetic is 99 plus percent solution. So you can imagine how much we have to weaken this super concentrated stuff down in order to get something that we use on a daily basis in a kitchen. In addition to that, glacial acetic acid is pretty potent, okay? If you took your nose and you smelt this bottle it would literally burn the inside of your nose, all right? And if you're guys, and maybe females as well, if you had nose hairs up in your nose, it would probably just burn them completely out. All right, well, this is stuff that I don't want to sniff, I don't want to inhale, and I'm going to maybe prep this under the fume hoods because of that reason. I don't want the odors, I don't want the stench that comes around with glacial acetic acid. Think of Easter on uh, steroids. Easter, eggs, coloring, a lot of times vinegar is going to be used for that purpose. It is just a soured, awful smell that fills the lab up, and I ain't having it today. So I'm going to go to the fume hood to prep this solution. What comes next? Uh, bromine. And folks, this is what bromine looks like. So we've uh, maybe have spoke about bromine before in the past, and bromine is going to come to me in a very dark amber bottle. I want to keep it out of the sun. Light energy has a tendency to take bromine and break it apart into its individual pieces, individual BRs, and allow it to react with other things. We don't really want that to happen when we order it, though, do we? So we want to make sure that it stays protected. And one of the ways that we do that is we put it in an amber bottle like you're seeing here. The company that has um, shipped this bromine to us that we've ordered for them, uh, it's called EMD. So EMD is the supplier of the bromine. And you might need the lot number for this bromine as well. So that lot number is going to be stamped up here on the label. It's 50273. So 50273 lot number, EMD is the manufacturer of that bromine that we will be using in the lab. Now here's the thing. Bromine also is going to be presented to me in terms of molarity. 
and molarity is not gram. So how much bromine do we actually have to use throughout this process? Well, in the lab directions, you're going to see that one molarity bromine is going to be required. And it never really tells you how much to make. Okay, that's the problem. It never really told you how much to make. It just told you how much to use. And I think the lab directions are going to tell you to use 10 milliliters at least. Okay, well, what if I started prepping this stuff? And what if I mess up? Oh, what if I have to do the lab again? Do I want to go through and make this bromine solution all over again? Probably not. All right, that would be silly. Or what if I actually spill some of this when I try to put it into the separatory funnel a little bit later? Or what if I'm prepping it into my graduated cylinder or my volumetric flask and I turn that over and I lose some of it? Folks, this is not very good. So I want to make sure that I have enough and I want to make sure that I'm not wasteful at the same time. So I at least need 10 mils. I need this concentration to be pretty close to one. So that means I'm probably not going to use a graduated cylinder. Remember, I told you those were like coffee cups of the lab. Graduated cylinders and beakers, they're coffee cups, folks. Yeah, there's pretty stamps on the front. It gives you a general idea of how much volume's in there, but it's not the best. And if I want something close to one or as close to one as possible, then I've got better things in a lab that I can use other than beakers and graduated cylinders. And these are volumetric flasks. All right, so volumetric flask, I'm going to go to my cabinet, and I'm going to see what I have. I've got 100 mil sizes, 250 mil sizes, 500 mil sizes, 1 liter sizes. All of those are going to be way too big. But I do have 50 mil sizes, and there's quite a few of them. I actually have 10 mil sizes, but we've already discussed I need more than 10 mils. We have 25 mils as well. But I'm just going to pretend like the 25 milliliter volumetrics were out of stock, right? We have very few of those, and those are typically the ones that people grab first. And they're always dirty. So 50 mils, good enough, right? If I do spill some, I've got some ex extra left over. If I don't need it, oh well, I've not made too much that I don't need it and that I was wasteful. Now let's talk about how to make this one molar solution. So molar means molarity, and molarity means moles per liter. Okay, so there's the setup for the definition of molarity, which is a strength. All right, well, I know that I need a one molar solution, so one is going to go in for M. The moles is going to be the one that I'm after. And the reason is because if I can get into moles like I did before, I can use formula weight to transfer that over to gram, and I can use my balance to weigh out those grams when I get to that point. All right, so 1 equals moles divided by liter. Well, how much do you want to make? A liter? No, I don't want to make a liter. I want to make 50 mils. All right, well, not a big deal. So take 50 mils and convert that over to liter because that is the required unit that needs to go here on the bottom. So I've pulled up my calculator so that way you can follow me if that's what you want to do and we'll do 1 times 0 0.050. Okay, so 1 times 0 0.050. Hopefully you can do that in your head and that's going to be 0 0.050 then that's going to give me moles, 0.05 moles of bromine. All right, so I'm going to come over to the side. I can do this in one set, but some people want to actually see that dimensional analysis setup, which is no big deal, not a problem. So my answer here is 0 0.050 moles of bromine that I need to use. All right, so let's set up the dimensional analysis problem. I'm going to take 0 0.050 moles over 1. Mole is on top. Mole goes on the bottom. Gram goes here. That's the unit that I need to go into. 
the formula weight for bromine, if I look on the label or if I look that up, is 159.81 or 159.8. So 159.8 grams in one mole. Folks, that's all that we've got to do. Once I get mole, I multiply by formula weight in order to get the amount of grams that I need. All right, so I'm going to multiply by 159.8, and I get close to 8. All right, 7.99. We're just going to say 8 grams. So 8 grams of liquid bromine is what I would need in order to make this solution. So keep that number in your head because later on when we take a look at some balance masses, we'll know where that number came from. All right, so I go to the balance now that I know how much that I need to weigh out. I mean, this is the amount of flour and sugar and eggs to make my cake, and my cake is transcendamic acid here. I'm going to tear the balance out. All right, so tearing the balance, all doors closed, everything shut. This is a 0 0.0000 gram. Now, what I did here is that I knew that my transcendamic acid was going to go into this round bottom bowling flask. All right, and this is not a very large piece of glass. So what I decided to do is just measure it directly into that container, not to use a weigh boat this time. I can measure the transcendamic addition directly into that bowling flask because these are really small. And the reason that I say that is because these balances analytical balances tend to have a max of about 210 grams. So if I have an analytical balance, that balance measures four decimal places, they're normally 210 gram maximum. Well, the mass of the bowling flask and the mass of the beaker that I've put the bowling flask in is nowhere close to 210. Okay, when I add my transdynamic acid to this, I'm still not going to be anywhere close to 210. So I feel really good about this process, and sometimes I do this to save me transfer steps. It helps my percent yields in the very end. All right, one less transfer, well, that's less product that is lost throughout the process. All right, so I took the bowling flask, and I put it into a beaker just so it will hold it up. And then I took that whole assembly over to my balance, and I did get a mass of it. I told you any time that I do this, I write down masses. I might not need them, but here it is, 153.2180. So that's the mass of the beaker and the bowling flask. All right, and then I tear that out. And the reason I tear it out is because I want a direct read, and I want the direct read of the transdynamic acid that I'm getting ready to add into that flask. So my directions tell me 10 millimolars. I know how much that is as far as gram goes, and I need to be somewhere in that ballpark. All right, so I go to my transdynamic acid. This is what it looks like, so you can make those observations as you see fit in your lab notebook. But that's what raw transdynamic acid looks like. A lot of people say, does it smell like cinnamon? And the answer is no, it doesn't really smell like cinnamon. Uh, it is a cinnamon relative. And there is a slight, what I would call, warm, nutty odor that comes from transdynamic acid. But it's not really a cinnamon type of smell. Uh, it's smelling a little bit like holidays sometimes, but nothing like cinnamon. All right? So I'm going to take maybe a small scoop, maybe a couple of scoops, and I'm going to slowly add it to this flask. And when I do that, I'm going to keep adding and adding and adding slower, slower, slower until I get something that's close to 10 millimoles. And here's where I stopped. 1.5767. So 1.5767 is the amount of transdynamic acid that I have used or I will use in this experiment. All right, so transdynamic acid's now done. Now, we need to go to my bromine. I need my bromine solution made. Who's going to make it for me? Nobody. That's how we work here. So, you're big boys and you're big girls. You can take care of yourself. Why do we need to make all of the reagents for you? So, we need to make the one molarity bromine. 
All right, so I told you that we had volumetric flask. This is what they look like. The way that we use the volumetric flask is right up here. I see the etched mark and that etching right there. That is going to be the 50 milliliters because this is a 50 milliliter volumetric flask. So at the very end of this, to properly make this solution, I'm going to add solvent until the bottom of the meniscus is right there at that line. All right, when I do that, I've got 50 mils exactly that has been prepped. All right, so I'm gonna take the volumetric flask and I start off all the time. I always start off with a little bit of solvent first. So this is my glacial acetic. Uh, this label, by the way, is called stock because there's no label on it, right? It just came from a jar that we've poured in there from another bottle somewhere in the lab. So I'm gonna take this plastic dropper. I'm just gonna suck up some glacial acetic. I'm gonna add it into this volumetric flask. You know, a couple of squirts at least. You can see the amount of acetic that's down here on the bottom now. Just to have a little pull for bromine to swim around in when I do get to that point and add it into this solution, all right? So a little bit of solvent goes a long way, especially in solution prep. So, so solvent added first, not up to the top of course, then we're gonna add our bromine and then we'll top it off where it needs to go a little bit in just a second. All right, so there's my volumetric flask. So now I need to go to my bromine. Well, I know I need about eight grams of bromine, don't I, right? We just said that, eight grams of bromine. So I'm going to take the volumetric flask. Again, it's a very tiny one. It is nowhere near 210 grams max. And I'm going to take that volumetric with some of the acetic. I'll put it on the balance and I'll tear that out as well. This will allow me to add the bromine directly into that volumetric flask. And I can keep track of the amount as far as gram goes from the balance. So again, it saves me a transfer. So I'm gonna go back to my bromine bottle and I'm going to take the lid off of the bromine and I do this under the hood. The reason is that bromine loves to react with moisture and that BR2 will react with even water vapor and you can breathe that into your lungs and all of a sudden you have hydrobromic acid in your lungs. You'll go to the hospital with chemical pneumonia. All right, that's something that we don't want. In this picture, it might be a little hard to see at first, but bromine is one of these funny things. Bromine is a natural liquid from the periodic chart. There's only a few of them. Bromine is one. But bromine at room temperature, we're almost at its boiling point. So that also means that bromine is slightly a gas as well. Well, as soon as I take the cap off of this bottle, what you can see in this picture, if you look really close, are some brown, hazy fumes. We kind of see it flowing in that way, don't we? All right, well, that's my bromine. It's evaporating. It's actually turning into a gas. It's leaving the bottle. It's filling up my fume hood. So my fume hood better be on because I want those vapors up and out. I don't want to be breathing those vapors in. So when I do this, I have to go quick. All right, well, I take the cap off. I put it under the fume hood first. And then I take a disposable pipette and I take it into my bromine and I suck out some liquid bromine, my BR2, right here, my BR2. Well, inside of the pipette, you can see what's beginning to happen. It's actually beginning to fill the pipette up with this brown, orangey vapor as well, right? And you can even see some more of the brown vapor that might have gotten caught in the camera picture. So this brown vapor is escaping everywhere. Got to be quick. So I'm going to take this pipette full of BR2 at this point, and now I'm going to add it to that volumetric flask that had some acetic acid. Now here's the thing with acetic. Acetic acid does a very good job of capturing bromine and keeping it in solution so it doesn't turn into a vapor, but some of it's still gonna do that. But acetic acid's gonna help me out a little bit and it's needed for the reaction anyway. We need this to be acidic conditions. So acetic acid, bromine, somewhat match made in heaven, but bromine's still going to escape if I'm not fast about this addition. 
All right, so I'm going to add bromine, add, 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 and now I get to an 8.6255. Now, I only needed an 8, so I'm more than a half a gram over. But here's the thing. My stuff is evaporating on me. Look at my volumetric flask. Okay, This evaporates fairly fast, so I need to overshoot it anyway. Because by the time I take this volumetric flask and get a mass of it, write that mass down, by the time I take that volumetric flask back over to my lab counter and add more solvent to it, more of the bromine is going to escape. My solution prep is not yet finished. There's still an, an extra step here that I have to do. So I'm taking that in consideration, knowing that once I get to the final step, I am going to lose more bromine than what's represented here, so the amount is going to be less than. In other words, if I did 8 grams exactly, by the time I get finished, I will lose some of that bromine and I will not have a 1 molar solution. It might be extremely weaker. So this is something that I would rather go a little bit over on than trying to get pinpoint eight grams exactly. So I take this volumetric flask over to the lab counter. Here it is. You can see all of this orange vapor that is now escaping my volumetric flask. There's nothing really I can do about this. Unless I had a cold volumetric, uh, that could have prevented some of this from happening. But I know that as soon as I add acetic acid to it and try to fill it up to that line, look at what happens. So more acetic gets added to the volumetric. That acetic is capturing that bromine that's getting freed up, and it's pulling some of that stuff back down in solution. And I'm going to keep adding acetic until I get to the top of the meniscus, and this symbolizes that I have just made 50 mils of that solution. So if you look, I've topped this off with acetic, but you see how the top layer here is kind of clear compared to the rest of it? This means that I need to mix it. So I'm going to put a cap on it, and I'm going to invert and mix this volumetric a couple of times. Typically, they say 30, all right? 30 flips with a volumetric flask, and you can ensure that that stuff is mixed extremely well. All right, so my lab told me water bath. So I'm going to go back to the water bath. I already had it heated up, and I looked at my water bath, and it's reading 51.5 degrees. All right, this looks really good to me. All right, and the reason is because that's close enough to 50. I am not that extremely far off, so whatever. If my oven was set at 352 and not 350, I'm probably not going to see a big difference with my cake in the very end. So not a big deal. Zooming in on the temperature, there you go if you need to record that for your lab notebook. 51.6 degrees for the warm water bath. Okay, so... Now I'm getting ready to prep everything in the glassware. The lab directions tell me go back to that glacial acetic and this time measure out around 6 milliliters of glacial acetic acid. So this is glacial acetic with no bromine in it at all, of course, right? No bromine. Just take the glacial acetic and add it to your transdynamic acid. So here's my graduated cylinder. There's the 6 milliliter mark, and you can see the bottom of my meniscus that's right there. So I just slowly added it until I got up to the 6 mils. Then I'm going to take my transdynamic acid, and here's what it looks like in the volumetric or in the boiling flask. You can make observations of that as well, starting reagents. That's something that we typically write down in a notebook. And then I'm going to take those two things, and I'm going to mix them. And here's a video that shows you what happens live when I do mix those two components. What you're seeing in the image is transdynamic acid. All right, so this is a molecule that has a double bond. I'm getting ready to dissolve that in solution. What you see over here to the left is a graduated cylinder or a part of one that has six milliliters of glacial acetic acid, the strongest acetic acid that I can use in the lab. So I'm getting ready to mix these two things together and I'm going to mix them live so that way you can make your observations as you see fit. So in goes the acetic. All six mils have been transferred. I'm then going to take this bowling flask out of the beaker. I'm 
then I'm going to take the bowling flask out of the beaker so you can see it and I'm going to give this a very good swirl and that's what goes on folks nothing more exciting than that so I'm getting ready to put this bowling flask onto my reflux apparatus and I'm going to let it hang out with the addition the slow addition of bromine see you know laboratory sciences can be very exciting but maybe this isn't just the best example for it so i've added those two reagents together i mix them very well you can make your observations after the mixing process happens uh, a little bit of a close-up picture of what goes on did it all fully dissolve did it get cloudy did it stay clear did it turn color those are the things that you want to write down in your laboratory notebook throughout this process um, just to make sure that i did give this long enough to mix I did continue to swirl it continue to mix it for one or two minutes about uh, give or take a little bit and that way you can uh, see if anything else changes as far as the observations go uh, so this is what it looked like before I put it onto the apparatus now before we add on that flask uh, this thing has to stay stirring the entire time so I'm getting ready to add the magnet into the solution and then I take this beaker and I put it into the hot water bath and that's what you're seeing actually right here in the picture so this beaker has the hot water down below uh, and this uh, kind of condensation up here that is from some of that warm water that it has just hit so the magnet bloop, dumps down inside of the flask and then if I take a look inside of the flask this is looking from the top down toward the bottom you see the magnet there in the center and then around that magnet you can see some other sludgy it looked very oily like droplets uh, some of it looked like solid but it looked more like a liquid instead of a solid in a way at this point so again you can use that some observations if you want in your lab notebook now let's take a look at the entire setup and this is what it looks like so my transdynamic acid is down here in the bowling flask and this is my hot water that's right there this is getting heated up it's turning into a vapor the vapors will go up and leave and it goes into my Claisen condenser then the separatory funnel that sits up above will be a way that I can drip 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 more bromine into that solution over time well as my vapors escape they can't really go up because that's going to be closed off so they will divert and they will go through this part of the clason and up into the reflux and the purpose of that reflux again is to condense that down and make it drip back down in solution so I do not lose any volume so folks there's your setup for the trans acid it's probably something that's going to be required in the lab notebook so if you need to pause the video at this moment take a few minutes draw the setup and kind of label and explain the pieces that's probably what the grade sheet's going to want you to do all right so here's a video of the complete setup Okay, so this is the setup for the transdynamic acid. If you can hear me over the fume hood that's running in the back, uh, here I've got my thermometer probe that's constantly recording the temperature of the water bath. I've not added the bromine yet. Uh, it tells me 50 degrees, and right now I'm sitting at about 52, so I'm close enough. Uh, here in the uh, hot plate, which is what I'm using because it needs a water bath, not a heating mantle, I've got a hot water bath that's going on in the beaker, and on the inside I've got the bowling flask that has my transdynamic acid and glacial acetic acid at this point. Up above, I've got what we call a Clayson condenser, and this is a split. And the purpose that I'm, and the reason that I'm using it is because above the Clayson condenser, I have a separatory funnel that is placed at that position. And that separatory funnel is holding my bromine addition. I'm going to slowly drip, drip, drip this directly into the bowling flask that sits below. And I'm going to heat it up at 50 degrees. So if I do get any vapor, if I do get any kind of gas that gets liberated from this reaction, it's going to go up the Clayson and it's going to go on this side, which is nothing more than a reflux condenser. So this is the setup 
of the trans dynamic asset addition folks there's all the pieces and parts that you need in order to get this thing to work so in the video, I kept calling it a Claisen condenser. And one of the reasons I do that is because very often it's attached to a condenser. Um, <clears throat> that's one of the reasons that we do use it in a lab environment. But the real name is an adapter, a Claisen adapter. But again, it's typically connected to a condenser. I just look at the whole thing together as a whole. All right, so next, if you notice in that uh, video, I had bromine in that separatory funnel. I uh, never really told you how I got it there, though. Uh, so I took that solution that we made, and I poured that solution into a graduated cylinder. And that graduated cylinder over here to the side, you're seeing 10 mils. That's what the lab directions tell me to use. So that's what I'm going to start with. So I'm going to take that bromine, and I'm going to pour it into the separatory funnel. And I'm going to put a cap on the separatory funnel just so that my bromine cannot escape because it will continue to turn into a vapor and try to leave. And so I want it to stay put, don't want it to go anywhere. So make sure the cap is on. And then the directions are going to tell me, add this in at least five portions, at least five portions. Okay, so here's the, in my head, this is what I did. We have five portions that are needed. We have 10 mils in total. So they're telling me to add about two mils every single time that I do this. One milliliter is 20 drops. That's just the rule of thumb. So that means I need to add no more than 40 drops every single time that I add the bromine to this solution. All right, so that's a number that's going to constantly go into my head when I do turn on the valve to the separatory funnel and add the bromine to that solution. Now, do I go to 40? Not necessarily, but 40 is the max. I don't want to go any more than that. And the directions say at least five. Well, that means it's open-ended. I can go six, I can go seven, I can go eight if I need to, but at least five. That is the minimum amount of portions that you should be dividing this up into. All right, so this is what it looked like before the addition of any bromine at all. All right, so that way you can make your observations in your notebook if you need to, but that is what that bowling flask looks like. So I'm ready to add. I'm ready to add my bromine solution into that flask. So I'm going to take the stopcock and I'm going to open it up and I'm going to quickly drop in a certain number of drops and I've count them. In addition to this though, there is a stopper up here on the separatory funnel. I want to quickly remove this when I add the drops and then quickly put it back when I stop adding the drops. Why? Because this will create some suction. And it's like your finger on top of a straw that's full of liquid. It does not come out. Folks, if you get to a point where you're trying to add solution through a separatory funnel and nothing is dripping out, it's probably because you still have the lid on it. So you need to take the lid off, and that way it will drip, 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 just like it's supposed to. All right, so here's my forced portion. Forced, my forced portion. All right, so here's the first portion. 11.16 a.m. is when this happened on this morning. Uh, I counted 30 drops, so I didn't go to 40. And there's the observation inside of that bowling flask when I did that. All right, now the lab directions are going to say, wait. It's going to say, add a portion and wait. Wait until the majority of the orange goes away. And it's a very light orange color instead. Okay, so this is the initial color that it turns into. And before I add the next portion, this has to go light orange. All right, so let me show you a video of adding the bromine. So this is what the trans dynamic acid bowling flask looks like as I add the bromine. It tells me to add it in five portions, uh, you know, a handful of amount at a time over the course of the next 10 minutes. So this is my first edition. Notice the color and the observation that it's turning because it's probably something important to put into your laboratory notebook.
Okay, guys, so here's the side view of the apparatus, so that way you can compare the darker color bromine solution up here at the top to the lighter at this point kind of tangerine peachy color that's down here at the very bottom. The reason I'm making you compare that is because this is what it will look like at the initial stages of the addition, and this is what it looks like after that addition is complete. So I am ready for my next portion of bromine at this point. All right, so I add more bromine and that goes darker, which makes sense. And that happened at 11.20 a.m. and I added another 30 drops. So I'm on my second addition for the bromine and the transdynamic acid. And I want you to take a look at the color again. I just added it. And you can see how dark of an orange color that it is. In the lab directions, it tells you to wait until that dark orange color goes to at least a light orange color. And as I'm recording this video, you actually might see it get lighter and lighter and lighter as it begins to react. The reason this color is disappearing is because the bromine is adding on to that double bond. It's breaking the double bond and that bromine is slowly getting destroyed. And only Br2 is that orangey color. So once the Br2 molecule has been chopped in half and added onto the alkene, that color is starting to disappear. So if you go back and rewatch the beginning of this video, you will probably see that this began a much darker orange than where we're ending up with now. If I compare that to what's up above, which is the bromine in the separatory funnel, you can see how dark that color is compared to this one at this point. All right, so I'm going to continue to add these small portions. I'll keep adding one portion after another after another until we figure out what happens at the end. All right, guys, so there you go. There's the uh, observation of the addition, at least. Uh, I'll just hit the play button again, and you can see what color that was in the very beginning compared to what it was that I ended up with. Uh, here's a picture of the Clayson condenser. The reason I took a picture of this is because I wanted you to look at the inside of it. Uh, it does look like there's orangey, brownish vapor that's starting to fill up the Clayson, and this is perfectly okay. It's what it's supposed to do. So as the vapors go up into the Clayson, it's going to hit the separatory funnel that has the joint addition. That's why we had to use a joint on the separatory funnel. We need it closed off. All right, so there's nowhere for it to go there. Then it's going to divert itself and it's going to go up through this part of the Clayson adapter and it's going to hit the reflux. And at the reflux, it will condense back down to a liquid and drop back down into my bowling flask. So something that I want to show you is the purpose of the Clayson condenser and the reflux. Uh, here's my transdynamic acid with the bromine. Right up above the solution, though, you see this orangey layer. That's all of my bromine that's really escaping the solution and trying to make its way out of those flasks and into my lab. And I don't want those vapors to escape. If you track it, you can actually see those orange vapors begin to go through the Clayson and up into the reflux condenser area. But up in here, what do you see? Nothing, right? There's no orangey vapor at all. So that's a very good sign that my reflux is working the way it's supposed to. It's keeping my bromine in the solution, or at least as close to the solution as possible, and that way it doesn't escape and leave my reaction vessel. All right, so that's the purpose of the reflux condenser. That's also the purpose of this Clayson as well. It makes me a very good joint, so that way I can add my bromine through the separatory funnel, and then the reflux can keep that bromine in this vicinity, at least. All right, so it looks like my um, solution has went to a very light orange color again, and I'm getting ready to add my next portion of bromine.
So that's one of the common problems that people always have when they do this lab in person is that they think it should go colorless, but at no point in time in the lab directions does it say that it actually goes colorless. It just says a lot orange or a very lot color. So they sit and they wait 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 and they're like, why is everybody getting finished? And I haven't even added my second portion yet. That's because you didn't read the directions. That's why. All right, so here's the temperature of the hot water bath about midway through. Notice it got a little bit hotter 53.8 it's still 50 ish though and i still feel pretty good about that temperature not a big deal with me at all all right so here's a video of adding another portion this other portion happened at 11:22 a.m so that way it gives you a time stamp and uh, 30 more drops were added at this step I'm getting ready to add my next portion of bromine and I want you to see this color change that begins to happen that they mentioned in the lab procedure with. So right now I'm at this kind of goldy color, very light orange color that it tells me to wait for before I add the next portion of bromine. Right now I'm getting ready to add my next portion. I'm going to add about 30 drops at a time. That's the way that I do this and as I begin to add I want you to see the color change that begins to happen. Notice this is not a golden color anymore. This is really now a very deep, kind of dark orange, almost red color. So I add about 30 drops and then I cut the flow off. I allow this to continue to react slowly. And then when I get that very pale, golden, light orange color, I'll just add my final portion at this point. So this was my fourth addition, and I've got about one more left in me before I get ready to go on to the next part of the lab procedure. All right, guys, so I think I misspoke on the actual number of portions that that was, uh, because here was the actual fourth portion. This fourth portion happened at 11.24 a.m. Uh, it was another 30 drops, and then finally, I thought that I was going to be at my last edition. It's not, but this is closer toward the end, and this is another edition of another 30 drops at this point, and I still had liquid bromine left in that separatory funnel, so I still needed to go further. One of the reasons I was using only 30 drops and not 40, which is perfectly okay. The lab directions told me that I could do that. So 1128, I get another portion, and that was another 30 drops. All right, so 1122, and then 1124, and then 1128. That shows you how quick that this process was happening. So we're at our last edition. I've just added it. Uh, notice that the beaker or the bowling flask right now is very deep orange again, and it should be. I just really added the last portion. And over time, we hope that this will continue to lighten because I'm going to have to sit and wait for 15 minutes. Uh, just to prove that I've added all of my separatory fennel edition, there we go. Notice the orangey kind of haze that's left over in the separatory funnel. And all of that is due to the bromine that escaped the acetic acid while it was sitting in there. All right, so I'm seeing that that haze also is taking part in the Clayson condenser. And as I go up to the reflux, the haze goes away. So again, a very good sign that my reflux is doing what it should be doing. And that's keeping those vapors in the solution. So I'm going to wait off for 15 minutes. I'm going to come back, take a look at these observations, and see where we go from here. All right, so I think that I preempted that slide with this one. So these actually should be switched. Uh, this fourth portion should have happened at 1124. So just bear with me here for the mistake. This happens at 1124, 30 drops, all right? Then two more portions were added. This was 1128, which is the timestamp on that video one. That was not correct. And then this should have been 1131, all right? So another portion of 30, a portion of another 30, and then the video and that video should have happened at 11.35. So all of that got kind of switched around when I prepped these slides up. Okay, so now all of my portions have been added. And my portions now say, once you've added everything, walk away from it. 
let it do its thing for a handful of minutes, and then come back. Just make sure that that water bath is still 50. And it was, 53.6, and this thing heated from 11.35 in the morning to 12.10 in the afternoon. All right, so after 12.10, I come back. And the lab directions tell me, look at your color. What's happening to the color of the solution? If it is still orange in nature, then you need to use cyclohexene in order to take the orange color away. There shouldn't be any bromine left over. That's a sign that bromine is still there. Well, why does cyclohexene work? Okay, well, cyclohexene is a ring that has a double bond in it. So by adding cyclohexene, it, I'm adding an alkene. That alkene has a double bond that can be broken, and that vapor, brownish, darkish vapor, is going to be attracted to that double bond, and it's going to break it, and it goes colorless. So that's why they tell me to add the cyclohexene. All right, so here's a video of the addition of the cyclohexene. Okay, so we're getting ready to add cyclohexene to this solution. The reason is that I still see a little bit of orange color that's associated here with the flask. I'm just going to add one or two drops of cyclohexene into the flask. You're going to see what happens here, if anything, and you can make your observations the way that you need to. All right, so there is the solution of cyclohexene. Keep in mind, cyclohexene is a double bond, and that double bond is getting destroyed by any extra residual bromine that might be behind. All right, guys, so that's one of the things that I really just hate about lab classes. You know, one of the, one of the things that I had as a student uh, were a couple of instructors that just said, follow the directions and just do it. And you never really questioned the steps. You know, why did we add cyclohexene at this point? There had to be a reason for it. Well, no one really took the time to really explain that addition. Why was that required? Why did it tell me to do this? And I think sometimes we overlook that or, or maybe we take that for granted. And uh, this is one of those cases that I think it's very relevant. So that's why I just paused and gave you a little bit of theory in this lecture experiment as well. All right, so here is the close-up of the final kind of solution color after the cyclohexene uh, was involved. And then it tells me to put it into an ice bath, so I do. So this is a beaker that's just full of ice, and you can see my beaker with the transcinamic solution product in there after the fact. And this ice bath is reading about 8.3 degrees. Uh, if I look at the observations of the ice bath, once it's in there, you can make observational changes if you want to, but that's what that looks like close up. And it stayed in the ice bath from 12.19 p.m. to 1.34 p.m. Yes, 12.19 to 1.34. Now I take it out of the ice bath. Why was it kept in there for so long? Well, I take it out of the ice bath, and this is what it looks like. So the lab directions tell me crystals should form, blah, 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 blah. And then it also says, well, if crystals did not form, this is what you need to do. All right, folks, so what you're seeing here is the uh, finished product of the transdynamic acid. And this is me actually getting at, out of the ice bath at the very end. And notice I don't really see any crystals along that beaker or in that solution. Uh, the only thing that I really do see is a magnet that sits down here in the very bottom. So the directions tell me to take something like a glass stirring rod, and that's what you're seeing here. I'm going to put it in the solution, and it tells me to scratch the inside of the flask. So I'm just going to take the stirring rod and give it a couple of jiggles and just scrape the sides of the glass to see if I can help promote the recrystallization or really the crystallation of my product here. So that's what I'm gonna to continue to do. It might take a few minutes and then I'll show you what this looks like after that process is finished. 
Okay, so you might have noticed an observational change almost immediately after I stopped scratching the inside of that surface. Uh, here's a close-up picture of uh, it coming out of the ice bath before that crystallization process took place. And then here's another video that happened just uh, really one or two minutes after me scratching the inside surface. Okay, so here's an update on the crystallization of that product after it gets out of the ice bath. As you can see, I am getting a very cloudy solution at this point, something that looks way different than what it was before, actually. Uh, and if you uh, can't see that, just simply go back and look at the other video on how this started out. So I'm just going to continue to scratch. I'm just going to continue to stir, and this is going to help promote the crystallization and the precipitation of my product. All right, so here's another close-up of that step. That way you can pause it and make observations as you need in your lab notebook. Uh, here's just another picture, maybe a little bit closer up of one or two minutes after that process happened. And then I felt really good about this, so I walked away. I walked away for probably 10 minutes, I guess, and then I came back. And this is what I saw in the flask. So I think clearly now you can see a solid that is beginning to form in that solution. And this is a major observational change at this point that we can write down into our lab notebooks about this uh, type of material. So after it sits, I do see more separation. I see solid falling out of solution. This makes me feel really good about this step now because now I have something to filter. If this did not happen, then I would have had a bigger issue. And that bigger issue would have been, what do I do from here? This whole thing is based on a solid crystal. If I can't get a crystal, what exactly happened? All right, so now that I know I'm going to have to filter, I go to my balance and I get this Buckner filter paper. Again, 55 millimeter in diameter. And there's the manufacturer of that filter paper. It's a Wattman filter paper. I go to the balance and I tear out the balance to make it read 0 0.0000. I put the filter paper on it and the filter paper is going to have a mass of 0 0.2092. All right, so 0 0.2092. I take that filter paper, put it inside of the Buckner funnel, and I turn the water on to create some suction. Okay, so guess what? We're at the transdynamic acid and I'm getting ready to filter. Once again, just to reconfirm it, I've got a filter flask. On top of the filter flask, I have a Buckner funnel. In the Buckner funnel, I have a piece of filter paper. And then the water has been turned on at the faucet in order to create this suction so I can begin to pull my liquid through the filter paper. And that way, my trans acid crystals, of course they're not trans anymore, are going to be up here on the very top. All right, so I'm going to pour these things through. Here is the flask. This is what it has finally decided to look like. And I'm getting ready to filter. Okay, so like any person, I decided to filter that solution through the Buckner funnel after I seated the filter paper. Uh, now, seated, maybe it's the accent here. It's seat, S-E-A-T, not seed, S-E-E-D. I'm not seeding the filter paper. I'm seating the filter paper. All right, so after I seat the filter paper with solvent, proper solvent, that helps me create some suction on that filter paper. It stops up the holes. I get ready to pour my solution through. Uh, I do have some residue that's left over in the flask. I'm going to have to get all of that out of there, right? So I added about 15 mils of uh, very cold water to this product, and I just gave it a really, really good swirl, and I poured that through the filter paper again. Uh, well, I still had some residue left over, so I took another 15 milliliters of ice-cold water, and I added it to that flask. I gave it another swirl, and then I poured it through as well. Now, after I do all of that, I then see something that's happening down into the flask that sits below. And this is what I see. Folks, what do you see there? I hope that you tell me some precipitation, some solid product that's beginning to form. 
So this means that something's happening. Maybe I didn't give it enough time to really filter out, but something's happening down into my filter flask where these crystals are beginning to form after it goes through the filter. So this is what the crude looks like on the filter paper. Uh, notice observation-wise what it looks like. It looks a little dirty, doesn't it? It almost looks like it has some orangey-brown that's left behind. And I'm still not quite done in my boiling flask yet. So that filter flask was a distraction for me. I still need to go in and I still need to add more solvent to that flask. And I did another 15 milliliters of ice-cold water, swirled, and poured it through. So at this point, what I have decided to do is take my filter flask away and exchange it for a new one. I need to re-pour all of that solution back through my filter paper because I formed a product that's down there in the very bottom. All right, so Buckner Funnel back on. I'm using the same filter paper. My product is still up there at the top. The only thing that I did was take off that filter flask that sits down below that had this soup of cold solvent with more crystals. And I just re-poured that through the filter paper. When I did that, as you can notice, this filtrate now is cleared up. No longer is there a solid that is down there that's sitting down below. Okay, so that's very good news for me. That means, okay, maybe at this time it did fully fall out, and I was just a little too fast on it the first time, and I caught it before I dumped it. So that saved me some of the percent yield. In that filter flask, this is what was left over. So again, you can make your observations there. Did I transfer everything? I don't know. You tell me, All right? And then after I poured everything through, I took another zoom in of that filter flask that sat down below, and this is what that filtrate looked like. So I felt really good about that. So I go back and I take a look at the crude product that's on my filter paper, and this is what it looks like. And I'm still trying to get out that extra crystal. So one more 15 mil portion, one more 15 mil portion of water went into that flask. And this time I took a brush and I just used that brush and I scraped around the insides of that flask and I swirled it and I poured it through that filter paper that had the crude on it. All right, so that cleaned up my boiling flask quite a bit. Well, I'm going to have to dry this stuff, so what does that mean? Well, I look at my product, and I notice that there's quite a bit. So I go back to my balance, I tear it out, and then I add a watch glass. And that watch glass is just going to hold my filter paper in any loose crystal that might fall off of that filter paper. The watch glass's purpose, that's what it's for. So the watch glass is going to weigh 33.0641 grams. So I take everything out of the Buckner, I put it onto the watch glass, notice that I do have some remnant that fell off during that transfer, which is fine, that's why I used the watch glass. I knew this was going to happen. And then this way you can make observations of the crude product. I will say though, this is not white, it's very shiny and reflective. Again, it's like a pearl, very strange color and sheen and shimmer onto the surface of these crystals. Nothing really that we've worked with so far has done that to us. But this needs to be dried. So I go to the oven that we have in our lab. I open the oven up. I record the settings on the oven. So that's the knob setting. And I record the temperature setting. And this is it. Good news is that this is above the boiling point of water. That's at 100, so I know it's going to drive water off. The other thing, though, I've got to be careful with is that there's two possibilities here for my product that the lab procedure gives me. One has a melting point of 98. The other has a melting point of like 204 or 208. I've done this lab so long, folks. I know what product is supposed to happen here, and it's not the 98 degree one. So that is why I was okay with cranking this above a 100. If not, what would have happened is I would have had to let this product dry on my lab bench 
for a couple of days and then come back to it after the water has completely dried out. I didn't want to do that, right? So I wanted to speed this process up. So I kept it in the oven, 4.16 to 5.27 p.m. All right, so that's a little over an hour this time, just to make sure that all the water was driven off. I take it out of the oven, and this is what I see, close-up wise. Again, you can make your observations. And then I also have a video that I would like to share with you in live motion of those products. What you're seeing in this video right now is the final, not the final product, this is the crude product of the Transdynamic Acid Edition. So this was Transdynamic Acid, I added bromine to that double bond, broke the double bond, put a bromine on each of those carbons involved in the double bond, and this is what the product looks like after I get it out of the oven. You can't really see it in the video, but this is not really a white powder. This is more of a pearlescent powder. Uh, it's very shiny, it's very shimmery, and you can't really see that. It just really looks beige in the video. But uh, imagine a pearl and imagine how that pearl might look like on a piece of jewelry. And that's exactly what this product, uh, the crude product at least, looks like at this point. All right, folks, so as bad as I hate to say it, I'm not quite yet done with the lab. Can you believe it? You probably can. So the next day I came back in and I went back to that crude product. It didn't look any different after I let it sit overnight. And now I need to recrystallize this product to make it pure. So the lab directions are going to tell me take ethanol. Well, here's my ethanol. This is a stock solution of ethanol. And to take water, and this is the water as well. It's just DI water that we get from our lab. And it wants me to make a 50-50 mix. 50-50 mix means half-half. So 25 of one, 25 of another, 50 of one, 50 of another, 100 of one, 100 of another, 10 of one, 10 of another. That's what 50-50 mix means. All right, so what I decided to do was do 50 mils of each one of these. So 50 mils of water, you can actually see that they are a little bit above 50, but that's okay. And then here's ethanol. I actually snapped this picture before I filled up the graduated cylinder with 50 mils of ethanol, but I used 50 mils of each one, and I gave it a good mix. And this is my recrystallization solvent. All right, so I go back to the balance, and I tear it. And then I take my product that I received from prior, the day before, and this is the mass of the filter paper and of the watch glass and of the product that you see. So 35.9520. 35.9520 gram represents watch glass, filter paper, and product. All right, I go back to my product. I pick it up with a scoop just to show you that it's coming to me in like one huge chunk, which is always kind of weird sometimes in a lab. And then I need to transfer that into a beaker, so I did. And then I rinsed with that 50-50 solvent the watch glass to try to get as much of the crystal off as I could. Then I took the filter paper and I also rinsed that with solvent just to try to get any residual that might be left behind on that filter paper into that beaker as well. That beaker has my crystal, my solvent, and I need to recrystallize. Well, as I took that beaker and gave it a swirl, my crystals were not dissolving. You cannot recrystallize unless you dissolve your crystal first. So what this means is that it needed to go onto a hot plate. So this solvent mix went onto a hot plate and I began to heat it very slowly. And what I saw was a slight clear up in that solution. So you're seeing some maybe crystalline formation that's happening up on the upper side of the beaker. And that's due with me swirling it and stirring it. And then down below, you can see that it went from something cloudy and milky to something that's beginning to clear up, and I can almost start to see through it at this point. Well, looking from the top down, this is what I see. Still kind of muddy, still kind of murky, right? And then as I just continue to heat it, 
it did clear up and I took it off of the hot plate and this is what it did. Now I can clearly see there are maybe impurities that are in that solution. Okay, So when my crystals reform, my crystals are going to reform maybe a little bit better than what they did before. And this is okay. It looked like sometimes we saw brownish kind of tannish specks in that solid. We mentioned those out before, and now I can really see those here. All right, so the setting on my hot plate with the recrystallization was here. I set it about halfway up. The reading on the hot plate was 244, but you really probably just need to say, I turned the knob halfway. And that heating process happened from 1.14 p.m. on that day to 1.20 p.m. Notice it didn't take very long at all. Well, I poured it through a filter to get rid of all of that crud. And when I did, it went into a beaker and I automatically started to see crystals that began to form. Look at there. Well, the directions tell me put it in an ice bath, so I did. I put that sucker in an ice bath and let it sit out and hang out for a while, chill out. So there's your observations in the ice bath. From the top down, this is what that precipitate, this is what that crystal began to look like. And the ice bath happened from 1.22 p.m. to 1.29 p.m. It did not take long for that either. I took it out, and this is what I saw. It's what you see now. To the side, there we go. Make your observations. From the bottom, that's what you see there. It almost looks like brown here, but it wasn't brown. It was just so much of it that it prevented the light to go through, and it just took on a different color. So I need to filter this again. Right, this is my recrystallized product. I go back to the balance, I tear it out. I go back to my filter paper, I get another sheet of filter paper, same make, manufacture and style, and then I get a mass of that filter paper, 0 0.2045. So that filter paper goes back into the Buckner funnel, and I take that recrystallized product and I pour it through. Again, make your observations. This is what was left over in the beaker after that process happened. So I added some ice cold solvent into that beaker, gave it a swirl, 50 milli or 15 milliliters is what I added. Looks like there were still some remnants there. And then on the sides of the beaker, it looks like there were some remnants there as well, right? You can see those. I can see those too. I didn't want to lose any of that. So I added another 15 milliliters of ice cold solvent. And when I did that, I gave it a swirl and a pour. And this was what was left over in the beaker. Hardly anything at all at this point. My recrystallized product, this is what it looks like. Again, I had to pour that through a Buckner funnel. So that's what my filtrate to look like. And it's cloudy. But I was not alarmed. And the reason is because I didn't see any solid formation. My filtrate can be cloudy. My filtrate can be colored. That's not a problem. But if I see solid formation in the filtrate, then I know that I didn't give it enough time. That's why I'm okay with this one, and I wasn't okay with the other one. All right, so then I go back to the balance. I know there's a lot of crystal in there. I need another watch glass, so I tear out the balance. I then go get the watch glass, bring the watch glass to the balance, and get a mass of it. That's going to mass out at 53.7953. So I take everything out of the Buckner funnel. I put it on that watch glass, and now I need to dry it. Now the problem is that I have some left behind. The scoop that I used to scoop out that stuff in the Buckner funnel, this product was really sticky, and it started to stick to the scoops and to the tools that I began to use in the lab. So here's a picture of that image, and then on the back side of the scoop, I see even more. All right, so there's going to be some product that has been lost that I'm not going to be able to recover, but I've at least make a note of it. So I take that product and I go back to the oven. There's my oven setting. 
Here's my oven temperature. Again, I'm okay with over 100 because I know what this is supposed to be. And that dried from 154 to 240 p.m. Almost an hour. When I took that product out of the oven, this is what it looked like. And once again, it comes to me in one big chunk, just like the crude product did. So here's the final product of the Trans Dynamic Acid Edition. Uh, the reason I'm doing this video is because look at the crystals. Yeah, they're all stuck together. It's like one big mass crystal chunk. And this is a kind of common of what we're seeing right now in some of the laboratory experiments that we're doing and that we're talking about. But folks, this is not a very common occurrence at all. Uh, you know, most of the time these crystals are individual, these crystals are very loose, but this is in one big mass chunk. So I'm just going to kind of break it and snap it if I can, and you can see how brittle and how hard that this product actually is. So I'm going to take these melting point tubes and I'm going to load up three melting point tubes and I'm going to take them over to our melting point system. <coughs> Excuse me, and we're going to get a melting point of these crystals uh, to see if we have made the cis version or the trans version. All right, so there's the observations of the, the recrystallized product at this point. Uh, I do know I need a weight, so I went back to the balance. I tear it out of balance 0 0.0000, just like always. And then I take that watch glass with the filter paper and the product onto that balance, and I get a weight of a 56.3252. So keep in mind, that is the mass of the watch glass, that is the mass of the filter paper, and that's the mass of my product. So how do we get the mass of the product that's what we're after and that's what that's what you need to do and find out all right so here's just a close-up of the final product again you can make your observations as you see fit and here at the very top you're seeing a capillary tube for a melting point uh, test that we're getting ready to do so I'm taking the melting point capillary and I'm crushing those crystals up that way that I can load these crystals up into a capillary tube. I use the tamping tool. So again, tamp, T-A-M-P-I-N-G, a tamping tool to force all of that product down here in the very bottom of the melting point capillary. And I need to prep three of those. So there's the three that I've prepped, and I now need to take those to the MP50. All right, so here's the MP50 instrument, and I've got a quick video on how to start up this machine and how to do the settings. In case you didn't get it the first time and maybe you need to add it to your lab book now, well, here are the directions to go through that process. So here's our MP50 steps. So I'm getting ready to put my uh, cinnamic acid product into the melting point system. Uh, just so that you know the steps of how to start up the MP50. Maybe you didn't get that last time, so we're going to talk about it again. I'm going to turn the power button on. The power button is going to be up here in the top right hand corner. This is the home screen. I'm going to go into manual method and operation mode. I am going to keep it in melting range for this experiment just again so you can see the difference of melting range and melting point. The start temperature, I'm going to have to go lower. One of my possible products is around 90 some degrees. So I'm going to start this thing at 85 just in case that is one of my products. I'm going to key in 95 and down here at the bottom, I'm going to press OK. Then the waiting time is how long this thing is going to start at that temperature before it actually begins to heat up. 30 seconds is the default. The heating rate, I'm going to keep it 3 degrees. It's going to be quite large of a range, but I want to get a really good melting point, so I need to slow this down. The end temperature right now is at 195. However, I'm going to change this to about 220. And the reason is because my other product has about a 200 and some odd degree Celsius melting point. So just in case it's that one, I need to go a little bit above. And then down at the bottom, I'll hit OK. 
And then finally, down here at the bottom, toward the last couple of sections, it's going to give you some fields that you do not have to change and you do not have to mess with. At this point, I'm going to hit start. And again, it's like preheating an oven. I'm going to let it heat up to 85. It will beep when it's ready. That's when I'll put my cake in the oven to bake it. And that's when I'll put my melting point capillary tubes inside of the instrument. Okay, so that's how we load up our samples into the Melting Point 50 or Mettler Toledo MP50 system. Uh, this was at the beginning of the process. Notice this started at 85 degrees right there on the screen. So all three of these are solids, and you can clearly see that they are solids in the viewfinder. Uh, in the beginning, it started to heat up, and right now we're at 165 degrees. And at 165, you're seeing that all three of these crystals are are still crystals they're still solid so that means that their melting points are higher than 165 at least all right so finally here toward the end uh, we are at 203 and at 203 it looks like i'm starting to see a little bit of crystals that are beginning to melt and i see a mix of wet crystal dry crystal and pure liquid down here in the bottom of the capillary tubes so this will let me know that my melting point is probably close to 203 or 204 degrees. So I'm gonna brag a little bit on these melting points. Look, all three of them did not give me a problem this time. I can't believe it. Well, in spot number one, spot number two, and spot number three, look at the start melting temperatures, 206, 204, 207. And then the end of melting, look at these, 208, 206, and 208. Folks, whenever I see 206, 208 that close, 204, 206, 207, 208, Whenever that range is a very close range, that means that this is a very pure product. So I feel very good about these melting point, uh, uh, or th this melting point data that's coming my way. And uh, I can make a note of that maybe in the laboratory notebook, that these were really tight, close ranges. And that's a very good sign that the product purity is very, very good. All right, so there's the data from all three samples, and you can use that melting point to determine if those bromines have added on to the same side or have added on to the different side of the molecule. So what you're seeing here is after the fact. It's after I have already analyzed them. I just wanted you to see when the crystals actually do melt and compare it to the temperature that's going to be up here on the top right hand side. Uh, so this machine is going to start analyzing it. I'm going to start fast forwarding it so we don't have to wait here forever. And there you go. So very quick, very fast. Uh, if I go back and just rewind we can replay not a big deal you can see right now they are still crystals i can still see them in the view screen up here we've got 198 for our temperature and as this approaches 206 204 207 down here in the very bottom you're going to see these crystals begin to change so as we wait patiently like waiting at the doctor's office we now see a little bit of flicker in the crystals. When we do that, we see some movement. This is at 203. And around 204, look at this. I really don't see visually any solid crystal that's left over. 204.5, 204.9. Now the question is always, why does the instrument give me these values down here? That's when the laser actually can make it through completely. So the laser sometimes lags behind your eyeballs. So this machine does a pretty good job in giving us a melting point, but honestly, sometimes we can do a better job than this machine can just due to the engineering aspect of how this thing works. All right, folks, so the very last slide that I have uh, for you with this lab experiment is the temperatures. So here they are. So in case you didn't get them down, uh, here is a screen that you can pause and maybe write them down. Uh, three separate samples were analyzed. A melting and an end temperature was provided with each one of these. In the lab directions, though, you're going to probably have to use an average. And this is how we do this. All right. 
So I'm going to average the starting temperatures first and do an average here. And then we're going to average the ending temperatures together. And we'll do an average there. And then I will, in the very end, take these two averages and I will average them together. And this will give me what I would refer to maybe as a melting point. If we had to do just one melting point and provide one number, and that is it, this is how we do it. All right. Uh, other ways that we can do this and report the data, we do triplicates like this. I could average the starting melting together. I could average the end melting together. And then I can just provide a range. And I can say, well, this product melted in this range and give the average start and the average end. That also would be appropriate sometimes as well. All right, but if we are after one number only, and that's it, just one number, this is how we do it. Average the starts, average the ends, and then average those averages. You cannot average six numbers here. And the reason is because it treats it as six separate samples. And your melting point averages will be off because of that. We did three samples, not six. And this is why we have to treat the data like this, all right? If you took all six together and averaged all six data points, then it pretends like all six are separate samples, and they are not separate samples. There are only three, not six. And we have to treat the data a little differently because of that. All right. Okay, so that's it of the transdynamic acid. I think that gives you enough laboratory data to go through and really write up a laboratory notebook and, uh, you know, kind of convince me of which product was made and the proof of how you got there. Uh, so double bond got targeted. Double bond was broken. Bromine was added on. We saw that with the orangey types of vapors that were happening. We made a product, we recrystallized the product, we dried the product, and then we got a melting point on that product. And that will help us to determine which way the bromine goes on to the molecule. Same side or different sides? And these mechanisms could be different depending on the compound that we have. All right. Okay, folks, so good luck. Uh, you know if you've got questions, you know how to get a hold of me. Send me a quick email, send me a text, do whatever you need to in order to answer those questions before you submit that laboratory report. So good luck writing it up. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I know that I've kept you for a, an hour and 30 minutes with this one. But again, folks, what I want you to remember, this could have been a three-hour lab, if not longer. And I just saved you half the time. Look at that. See, I've always put in your interests first. And here's the proof. Proof in the pudding.